Assalamu alaikum children. Welcome to your very own program called the 10 Tales of Taf. So this is a 10 uh, program series uh, about 10 personalities and it's called the 10 Tales of Taf because Taf is another name for Karbala. Now do you know which month it is? Yes, Sarah? Yes, it's the month of Muharfa. And which which calendar is it? Lunar calendar. Uh, is it lunar calendar? Yes. Lunar calendar, also known as Islamic calendar. Muharram is the first month of lunar calendar. And is it a sad month or a happy month? It's sad. It's sad because this is the month in which the grandson of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was martyred in the land of Karbala. Now he wasn't alone there, he had a lot of friends and companions and family members who were also martyred in Karbala. Uh, and today is 1st of Muharram and we are going to uh, discuss a personality, learn about him. It can be a friend of Imam Hussein or a family member every day. Uh, and also you must be wondering who this beautiful lady is in these lovely, strange looking clothes. She doesn't look like she belongs to this, this part of history, right? No. no. Are you? Oh, that could be true. Probably she has time, time travel. Shall we ask her? Yes. Yes. So, I already know who she is, so I'll ask my beautiful friend from history, from actually 60 Hijri, from 60 Hijri, to introduce herself to our friends here. Asalaamu Alaikum, children. Asalaamu Okay, now you don't know who I am. My name is Dalem. And you know who Dalem is? Yeah. No. No. I knew that not many people know about me. It's quite sad. I feel sad when I find out that not many people know about me. Now, let me tell you. My husband was a businessman. His name was Zuhair ibn Qayyim. And he used to go to business trips a lot. He was a rich man. He gave me all these things, lovely clothes, jewelry, and I always had Whatever I wanted. So we were on a business trip. And you know what? We were traveling to another place. And while we were traveling, parallel to our caravan was Imam Hussein's caravan. And they were traveling too. Now, Zuhair at that time, my husband, he didn't know Imam Hussein much. I kept telling him, Don't you know Imam Hussein? He just didn't want to know. He was too busy his business earning money i kept telling him i said he is the grandson of the prophet he said okay so that made me really sad but i didn't stop because i knew the status of imam hussein i knew that god loved imam hussein i wanted him to know so we traveled and then god heard me what happened our caravan was traveling parallel to each other. We stopped. And there was a man who was sent from the other caravan. He came and he said to Zuhair, he said, Zuhair, Imam Hussein wants to see you. Zuhair didn't want to know. And I went to him and I said, Zuhair, you are so fortunate. Imam the grandson of the prophet wants to see you. And you don't want to know? So I said, but I'm busy. I need to do my business. We need to move on. I said to him, please go. Please, I'm your wife. Please go and meet him once. So Zuhair listened to me and he went. And when he saw him, I was saying, It was all for him. He just became, he was, he became wonderful because 
that was the status of the scene. He was the master. Zuhair came and he said, Imam Hussain wants me to come with him to Karbala and get martyrdom. And I said, what? Imam Hussain asked you? And he said, yes. I said, so, so what are you trying, what are you thinking? Are you going to go? In my heart, I was thinking, he's not going to go because why would he go? Because he's a businessman. He's a businessman. He wanted to? Do business. He just wanted to do. But guess what? Do you think he changed his mind? Yes. Why? Because he could have left him on the same. He didn't him. He really liked him. The noor of Imam Hussain influenced him. The talk, the love that comes from Ahlul Bayt made him fond of Imam Hussain. And he said to me, he said, Dalem, I give you permission to go and serve the holy progeny of Imam Hussain. So I said to him, but Suhail, I'm your wife. It's your right. You need to take me. You need to keep me. I have to serve you. I want to do things for you. He said, no. Now our life is devoted to Imam Hussain. So when he did, he said to me, Dalem, because I want to focus on serving Imam Hussain, I'm sorry, I'm going to divorce you. So you can do your work for me. He divorced me. I was fine because the purpose was to serve Imam Hussain. And we both, at that time, we started traveling with Imam Hussain. And you know, I was so fortunate because I saw everything that happened from Karbala to Sham. And I even went back with them to Medina. And I think this is what I'm going to tell you throughout what I saw. Because this lady here, Sister Nergis, she wanted me to tell you everything. Before we stop, let me tell you what happened to Zuhair. Zuhair just wanted to give his life for Hussein. You know what he did? On the 10th of Muharram, in the battlefield, Imam Hussein was fighting, fighting. But then there was a time for Zohar and Asr. And here, even in battlefield, Imam Hussein wanted to pray in Namaz and Jamaat. And Imam Hussein said, I want to pray Zohar. And you know what Zohar said? He said, Imam, arrows are coming from everywhere. I want to protect you. And Zohar stood in front of Imam. And there was this namaz, and this namaz is called Salat al-Qaf. Namaz al-Qaf. Because this is another name when you do a Salat in a battlefield. You know, not everybody can pray together. Because some people are protected. So they stood. And you know what happens when the arrow come to you? What would you do? Would you go and stand in front of the arrow? No. no. You would take it, wouldn't you? So you miss it. But that didn't happen. So here, the arrows were coming from left, right, and center. And Zuhair was moving everywhere and taking arrows on his chest. And eventually, he died. He was martyred. And that's the story of my husband, Zuhair. I hope you like that. Dalem, I was thinking how lucky you are to have witnessed everything with your own eyes. And and you had the opportunity to serve the Ahlul Bayt, to serve Lady Zainab, Lady Umm Kulthum. You were there. You went through all the troubles with them. You were there to comfort and caress little oh, Luqayya, I was. Little I, was. I don't even want to think about it. But children, do you think if only there was a way, if only there was a way we could probably go and visit and actually see some of these things with our own eyes, how it all happened. How did um, the Imam end up in Karbala? He was living his life in Medina. His family was around him. His children were uh, in at his house. They had a lovely, beautiful, peaceful life. What happened? I wish there was a way to just go into history and look at things. Do you really wish? want to? Do I you? would love that. Yes. Oh, 
as much as I don't want to experience that again, but I have a way. Really? Is I it do. possible? I do. do you have a time machine? Something like that. I can take you back and tell you some I can't of the past. My ears. I have a look at his children. This is my special history chest. It will take us to different cities while Imam Hussein is, and his caravan was traveling. And it might take us to different people. Shall I open it? Yes. My friends, I wonder where we're going to go. I'm going to choose this one. It's written in Arabic. I wonder if I can read Arabic. I wonder if you can. Um, Kufa. Kufa. Well done. That's this. This is Kufa. Al Kufa. Where is Kufa? Yeah, we have a model of Kufa here. Kufa and is one of the cities of, of uh, current Iraq. But we are not going to current Iraq, right? No. Are we, is this chest actually going to take us back into history? Yes, it is. You might not see it. If, you've vis if you have visited Iraq now and have visited the holy shrines, it's not like that when we visit the history. It's very different because they were still alive. So no shrines, very different. So who would like to go to Kufa? Me. Let's go. O oh, people of Kufa, you have gathered here today because you are supporters of justice and enemies of corruption, supporters of freedom and enemies of oppression, supporters of equality and enemies of discrimination. Justice is a right, freedom is a right, equality is a right. O oh, people of Gufa, the man you have sworn your allegiance to is a man who invites people towards the good and prevents them from the evil. A man who upholds the traditions of his grandfather, the Holy Prophet Muhammad. This man is Hussein and he is coming towards you. So I ask from you two things. Hold on to your oath of allegiance to him and fear none but God the Almighty. For surely God is the most merciful and most generous to each and every single one of you who keep their promises. Ya Mansur Ahmed! 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 Yaman Sur Ahmed. Yaman. Wasn't 
that exciting, children? Yes. Who do you think that that person was? The the one leading prayers and giving hey. that speech? Yes, Zanali. The cousin of your mom. Yes, the cousin of Imam Hussein. What was his name? Muslim ibn Aqil, well done. Do you know the story of Muslim ibn Aqil? How come he end up in, ended up in Kufa? How, where did he come from? What's his title? Who is he? Yes, uh, Zainab, you tell me. He came from Medina because that where, that's where he used to live. So let me tell you the story of Muslim Ibn Aqil and who he is and why is he so important in history. Okay. Now I have to start from the uh, from a bit back in history when a person called Muawiyah was the king. Oh. Now Muawiyah was uh, a person who uh, who had taken over Syria and he. Um, made himself, declared himself a king, and he had a son called Yazid, who was uh, basically good for nothing. And Muawiyah put it in his will that after I die, my son Yazid will be the caliph, the leader of all Muslims. So when Muawiyah died, Yazid became the caliph. And the first thing he did, he sent out his messengers to all the cities that was that were under Muawiyah at that point and asked for allegiance from all the important people in the cities, including Imam Hussein salam. Now Yazid was a kind of person who had no respect for any of the Islamic values. He used to drink alcohol, he used to do, he instead of being a good leader and um, you know attending to people's matters, all he would do was, was play with his pet monkey. And he was a very non-serious and um, basically a person who would commit any sin without any hesitation. Now, would Imam Hussein give his allegiance to such a person? Yes. No. 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 Well, that's okay. That was just a slip of tongue. Now, Imam Hussein would never accept such a sinful person as his leader. And... He was, of course, the rightful leader of all Muslims in the world and actually the Imam, the spiritual leader of everyone on the earth. Now, I think Daylam would remember what, the, what it was like uh, when Yazid took over. And he chose the worst, the most cruel people to rule over the lands that, he, that were under his government. So Imam salam, refused to you know, pay allegiance to Yazid. And at the same time, people of Kufa, they were so tired of all the uh, cruelties of, of the people, of the governors that Yazid had sent. They thought, if one person can help us come out of this, um, this problem we are in, is the grandson of Prophet Hussein. So they all gathered, and all the important people uh, of, of Kufa, they, they wrote letters and signed and they stamped their names. Uh, people like Mukhtar ibn Thaqafi, people like Sulaiman ibn Surat Khuzai, people like uh, Hani ibn Urwa. They all wrote letters and stamped them and sent them to Imam Hussein. And Imam Hussein, uh, on the other hand, left Medina and um, moved, he started moving towards Kufa. First he went to Mecca and then he chose Muslim ibn Aqil and some other people including Qais ibn Musakhar to carry his letter to people of Kufa so he can assess whether he, they're actually with him or not. Now Muslim ibn Aqil didn't want anyone to know that he's going to Kufa so you, guess what he did? He stopped the letters. Who stopped the letters? No, Muslim ibn Aqil, who was the harbinger of Imam Hussein, he was chosen because he was the closest, one of the closest ones to Imam Hussein. He was one of the people Imam Hussein trusted the most. So, but they didn't want uh, anyone to find out. So, you know what they did? They first, instead of moving towards Kufa, they moved towards Medina. 
And when once they got to Medina, they took two people uh, who could guide them towards Kufa. They took a different route that normally people don't take. So from Medina, they started moving towards Kufa. But what happened on the way? They, they, they lost their way in the desert. And for days and days, they were moving and they didn't know where the destination is. And they were so hungry and thirsty. It was so bad that the two people who were supposed to guide Muslim and his companions passed away in the desert. And Muslim lost his way. And after walking and walking in the desert, in the heat of the desert, he found a place where he could see some people, some houses. So he went there and someone gave him food and then he found a person whom he could trust and he sent a letter to Imam Hussein saying that I think this is a sign that we shouldn't continue this journey. But Imam Hussein said that no, you have to do this. This is the will of Allah. We have to do this. So Muslim continued on his journey and he went to Kufa and Kufa was a very important city. All the soldiers used to be in there. And there, first he went to Mukhtar's house. He stayed there. And all the people who believed in Imam Hussein used to come to Mukhtar's house. And secretly, Muslim would read the letter that Imam Hussein sent. And people would promise, pay their allegiance to, to Muslim ibn Aqil. And they would promise that please, please ask our Master Hussein to come. We promise we are going to help him. We are going to support him. Just come and overthrow this tyrant called Yazid and we will support Imam Hussein till the last drop of our blood and this and that. So, within a few weeks, Muslim had gathered 30,000 signatures from people who had said that we will support you. So in now in Kufa, there were approximately 60,000 soldiers, people who could, yeah. So half of them already stamped. Rest of them were not all against Imam. Some were neutral and some were against the Imam and pro-Yazid, in favor of Yazid. So they had a huge majority who could probably very easily overthrow the government of Yazid in Kufa, right? Um, and then when they were preparing for uh, a war against Yazid, what happened is, so Muslims sent a message to Imam Hussein saying, saying that Kufa is ready. People of Kufa are ready for you. Come and let's wage this war against Yazid and throw him out of the government. Uh, but at the same time, as the messenger left Kufa, someone entered Kufa. Now, Yazid had an evil plan. Because at that time, the government of, government, governor <coughs> of Kufa was a person called Nu'man. Nu'man was a bit lenient. He wasn't so fond of Yazid. So he wasn't trying to stop Muslim or anyone. So Yazid, some people, some spies in Kufa sent messages to Yazid saying that Numan is being very lenient. Numan, Numan is weak. If you want to save Kufa from Imam Hussein, uh, send someone more strict uh, who can deal with these people. So Yazid sent Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. Now Ubaidullah was known for being cruel and reckless. So he played a nasty trick on people of Kufa. You know what he did? He pretended to be Imam Hussein. He dressed up as Imam Hussein he because did. He, green was a sign of um, of Ahlul Bayt, the family of Holy Prophet. He dressed up in in a green turban, covered his face, and told his troops to dress accordingly, and pretended to be Imam Hussein and entered Kufa. And when he entered Kufa, and when everyone found out that Imam Hussein is here. Everyone who had supported Muslim came out and they all were uh, shouting, Ya Mansoor, Amit, Ya Mansoor, Amit. They were all, you heard that, didn't you? That slogan? Yeah. 
So this was a slogan that Holy Prophet used to use in his battles. And it started from the first battle, which was called Battle of Badr. It means that um, you know, Mansur is actually the leader of the angels who came to support the army of the Prophet in that battle. Yes, Sara? Yeah, I'm explaining that now. Ya Mansur is that angel. When we say Ya Mansur Ahmed, it means, Oh Mansur, leader of the angels, come help us bring death upon our enemies. So that's what it means. That's what it means. So they all came out and they said, Welcome, O oh, grandson of Prophet. And Ibn Ziyad was watching. Okay, these are the faces. These are the ones who promised Muslim and sent letters to Hussein, let me teach them a lesson. And he was watching carefully and taking notes in his mind. And once the whole the crowd was gathered, he took the cover off his face. And people were shocked. And straight away he gave such stern and cruel statements. He said, whoever supports Muslim will be killed and their families will be destroyed. And he urged all the leaders of the tribes to bring forward all the names of the people in that tribe who supported Muslim and declared a death degree, decree for all of them. People were so scared that one by one, they started to change sides. They started to leave Muslim alone until when Muslim felt that Kufa, people of Kufa are not going to support Imam Hussein, he wrote a letter and gave it to a person and said, Quickly, get out of Kufa somehow. Sneak out and get this letter to my master Hussein. Tell him that the people, people of Kufa, their hearts are with you, but their swords are against you. If you come here, they will not show mercy to you. So that person left, and now Muslim is left alone, and he had to then hide in the house of a person called Hani ibn Urba. Hani ibn Urba uh, was leader of a tribe when now Ibn Ziyad had a spy called Maqal. Maqal. This person Maqal would pretend to be a lover of Imam Hussein and be very sincere. He came and wrote a letter, he stamped his name, but in his heart he was with Yazid's government. So he he came into the house of Hani, he found out all the secrets, he found out where Muslim is living and he gave all the information to Ibn Ziyad. And Ibn Ziyad then called Hani ibn Urwa and told, asked him to give Muslim away. And Hani refused. And he kept refusing until he was martyred. And when that happened, now Muslim could see that it's either we have to strike or we will be killed. So he called whoever was left who could support him. He called everyone to surround the uh, uh, Darul Amara. It, there was a building called Darul Amara where where the governor would live and you know do his jobs uh, and his duties. He said, "Surround Darul Amara." From thirty thousand, his supporters re were reduced to four hundred. So four hundred people marched with Muslim and they surrounded that building. Inside were only seventy people. So even now there was hope if people had stood fast and he, if they were courageous enough they could still take over Darul Amara and get rid of Ibn Ziyad. But Ibn Ziyad had a, had a trick up his sleeve and he told his people, the people who announce things, he said go and tell these people that a huge army is mo has moved, started to move from Syria towards Kufa and it's going to reach here any moment. So if you want to save your own lives and your family's life, lives, leave Muslim alone and go back to your homes. If you go back, you will be saved. But if you stay with Muslim, the moment that army arrives, you will be destroyed. And slowly, slowly people started to go back to their houses. So when the time for Maghrib prayer arrived, Muslims started to lead prayers. When he, st he stood to start his prayer, to lead his prayer, there were probably 400 people. When he finished Maghrib prayer and he looked back, there were half of them were gone. There were probably 100 or something left. 
Then he stood up and he led Isha prayer. And when he finished Isha prayer and looked back, there was no one. Muslim was alone in the mosque. And he didn't know where to go. He did not have one supporter. He did not have a place for shelter. He came out of the mosque and he was just walking in the streets. He didn't know where to go. All those 30,000 people, they turned their back on him. And one lady called Tawa, she recognized him because he was so, so thirsty. He stopped at her door. He knocked and said, can I have a glass of water? And that lady gave him a glass of water and then she recognized him and she took him in. You're safe here. Stay in my house until it's safe for you. <coughs> then she served him food. But she, her son was one of the supporters of Ibn Ziyad. And he found out that there's someone in our guest room. And he questioned his mother a little. And he found out the truth. And he went and told Ibn Ziyad about the guest in his house. So in the morning, Ibn Ziyad, probably during the night, Ibn Ziyad sent 70 men to capture one person, Muslim Ibn Akhir. And he fought so bravely that he, they had to call for more people. And he kept fighting, fighting, fighting. He was surrounded, surrounded from four sides. And they would even throw fire at him. His clothes, his robes were on fire and he was fighting in four di directions until they all attacked him together and then they captured him and he took they took him to Darul Amara and he was thirsty when he was standing there he said there are only three things I wish one that give me a glass of water before you kill me because he knew this is the end and they're going to kill me now yes, Ali. didn't they push him off the, um, the really high tower then? yes because first they brought him in front of Ibn Ziyad. You know, they promised him that if you come to Darul Amara, we're going to protect you. But they broke their promises. That's one of the signs of the enemies of Allah. They never keep their promises. So he said, give me a glass of water. Second was that, please, when, when if you kill me, bury me with respect. And the third one was that, send a messenger and tell Imam Hussein not to come to Kuwait. Do you think they kept those promises? No. They did not keep any of those promises. And they took him to the rooftop of Darul Amara and they martyred him first. And then they threw his sacred body from that tower, like Aliya said, onto the ground. And then they called the people of Kufa and, and, and showed them his body and said, look, this is what's going to happen to supporters of Imam Hussein. They broke all three of the promises. And I wonder if the messenger got there in time for Imam Hussein to receive this message. And did Imam Hussein then, then change his route or not? Daylam, were you there when this happened? <sighs> You've reminded me all that time. <clears throat> I remember the time when Imam Hussein received the news of martyrdom of Muslim. Imam's eyes were full of tears. I was there. We were, we were, we were still traveling. That place was cold, I can't even remember. We were there and we were just, I was looking at Imam. Imam's heart was heavy with sadness and his eyes were full of tears. Oh, he did. He called the little daughter of Muslim. Her name was Atika. Now, when Atika came to Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein hugged her, kissed her, and told her to sit in his lap. He said, Uncle, are you okay? Imam Hussein put his hand her head and started doing this and he said to Atika, he said, Atika, from today I am your father. I'm going to give you all the love 
your father used to give you. And Atika got worried. She was only little. She just looked at Imam Hussain. You know what she said? She said, Uncle, what's happened to my father? Why are you going to love me like my father? Uncle, have I become an orphan? And I can't tell you what else. Everybody there was crying. Everyone knew a Muslim has been killed. But Imam gave everyone hope. And he said, we must carry on with our travel. He did not change his mind. He wasn't fearful. He wanted to stand up against Yazid, who wasn't following the religion. Muslim gave his life for the religion, for the right path. Imam Hussein, he followed Imam Hussein, and we followed Imam Hussein. We carried on our trip. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to our second segment of the program. Inshallah, we will be sharing a variety of activities in our program and talking to many talented people of our community. We have our guest speaker here, Brother Qasim. Brother Qasim is, mashallah, a graduate of in economics and um, works in a bank and also um, does acting in Islamic place. So uh, welcome, Brother Qasim, and thank you for making time for us. And um, uh, can you please introduce yourself to our audience? Yes, yeah, so uh, my name is Qasim Hussain. I'm 26 years old and I'm from East London. Uh, so I went to school in Redbridge as well, where I studied a bit of drama uh, over the years. After finishing school in sixth form, I went on, on to university um, in Leicester, so University of Leicester, where I also studied economics. And while I was there, because um, I have this passion for acting, you can say, I met a group called Ridaidullah Theatre. Uh, these people focus around theatre plays on characters involved in the life of Imam Hussein and the build-up to the events of Karbala. And I thought... This is a way for me to keep my acting alive, and I took part in acting since then. So this was since about 2012 now. Mashallah, it's uh, amazing. I, we have seen your plays, so you. we know it's um, you did amazing work. But what did, what inspired you to act in an Islamic plays? Well, for me personally, um, I do love acting. Um, ever since I started doing it in school, I just enjoyed it straight away. And when I thought and met these people who do these plays about Imam Hussein, I thought I'd be killing two birds with one stone. So I'll be doing one where I'm doing what I love and I'm doing something for the cause of Imam Hussein. Uh, so that's where the passion and drive comes from. And when I met these guys, I got involved straight away. And Alhamdulillah, they're doing really, really well now. And I hope to, inshallah, continue it going forwards. Mashallah, it's um, amazing. Uh, I know that with many, even my with my own children, we have your uh, seen your plays, and uh, my children were also very inspired. And many children in the community, um, you know, wanted to act after mm. you know watching your plays. Uh, which characters have you uh, played so far, and which one was your favorite, and why? Uh, well, I started since twenty twelve, so over eight years now. I played quite a lot of characters. Um, but in the last three or four years, I've played the main roles. So some of those include uh, Muslim Ibn Akil, the cousin mm. of Imam Hussein, mm. uh, Gais Ibn Mushir, mm. who was someone who traveled with the camp of Imam Hussein towards Gufa when they went on their journey. And I also did one on Suleiman Ibn Razin. So he is sort of lesser known, but he was responsible for sending a message in Basra. Uh, these three were probably my favorite, but of the three, I'd probably say Muslim Ibn Akil. I think um, with this character, there's just so much story behind him. There's so much depth to his character. And what he did for the cause of Imam Hussein was before the battle. So he was one of the shaheeds that was not involved in the actual battle itself. And playing him felt very, very special because he's such an iconic person in the history mm -hmm. and in the whole build-up. And he was such an important person to Imam Hussein as well in that respect. So I think I have a massive connection with him and definitely my favourite. How did you feel as that character? It was very mixed. One, I felt very nervous mm. and very scared, you can say, because when you're representing a character like Muslim Akil, who has this grand stature, uh, you need to do him justice. So if you're going to be performing as him on stage, you need to make sure you do a good performance because people will have expectations of what this character looks like and what he should be like. And then on the other side, I felt very proud 
because I have the opportunity to embody a character who was part of the Athol Bait and it almost made me feel like I was a part of the family. I didn't feel like I was Qasim. I actually felt like I was Muslim Ibn Akil for those two hours where I was in the play. And it was it was just a massive deal. You just feel so connected, so touched. And it feels like I was the one who was going on that journey. It was amazing. Well, I have cried every time when, was, when you, it was the time of Shahada of mm. Imam uh, Hazrat Muslim Ibn Akil. And it was very like, even kids were like very upset for um, it was very difficult to, uh, even for children, they were saying, oh, you know, Qasim Bhai, what <laughs> happened to you? So, um, what character would you like to play in the future? In the future, there's quite a lot of characters, but I think there's one, probably Hazrat Abbas. Mm. Hopefully, when there comes a time where the Theatre, you know, put forward a production in his name, that would be a massive honour to play as one of the probably the grandest, the flag bearer, you know, of uh, Imam Hussain's army. That one would be very difficult to play because that's, like, everybody knows who Hazrat mm. Abbas is and what he's done and mm. most people, I think, connect to him the most. Mm. They feel his sadness the most. Mm. So I think if it ever came to a point of choosing a character to play, I think he would be the one who, where I could say I've reached the top if I've... Inshallah. Him. Inshallah, we would love to see you in that I hope character. so one day. And um, did you act in the school? Yes, so the first time I ever did act was in year seven when I joined at 11 years old. So when I started the drama classes there, I really enjoyed it. That's where I knew I had like a passion for this kind of art. And then the first time I ever did a grand performance in front of a large audience um, was in a school play when I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So that was the, another turning point for me where I realized that people enjoyed watching me act. And I thought if I'm doing a good job at it, let me try to continue it. And then when something like this comes along with regard to the theatre, put two and two together and it's like a no-brainer for me so I had to push forward to do this. Mashallah, mashallah. Would you like to give any message to our audience? Uh, yeah, um, so to all the audience I think my main message would be to be open to new ways of spreading the message of Imam Hussein. So theatre for example hasn't been around as much as I'd like it to be within the Muslim uh, criteria you can say. Um, so I'd like people to be more open and be willing to accept it because it's such a huge way of showing what's actually happened. So instead of people listening to what's happened, they actually see what's happening in front of them. So it almost feels like you are there. And another thing I would say is that um, don't be shy in trying to take part in these kind of things as well. If there's something like this on offer for someone to take part in, uh, don't refuse it. You don't need to be talented. You don't need to have previous experience or anything of such. So in regard to the theatre, a lot of us are not professionally trained or anything. We all do it because we love doing it. Um, so I'd say be open and just go for it and enjoy it as well while you're at it. Thank you very much. We thank you on behalf of 14 uh, and uh, wish you all the best in the future. Thank you very much.